three. Three fucking people. 450,000 plus die from smoking cigarettes. Not only is it acceptable, it's fucking um, expected. You smoke it in rehab. You go to rehab and you can start a cigarette habit, the drug that kills more people than anybody else. Now, does that sound like priorities are in the right situation? No. Fuck no. Fuck no. It's all based on evil agenda. It's all based on bullshit uh, money. It's all you can't you can't put a patent on a plant. Okay, they we've we've got thirteen states right now that have legalized medical marijuana. So that if a doctor recommends that marijuana will help you, you're protected by the state law to uh, to you know to pursue that. Now the federal government still denies it. The federal government says there's absolutely zero medicine in marijuana, which I can tell you is bullshit because I said my wife used it going through chemo. And, it, and, and so because of the federal government holds that position, they go and they, they bust medical dispensaries where they give uh, medicine to people. They throw patients in the jail. They don't care if they're quadriplegics. They even shoot people coming into their house to try to steal this natural, organic, harmless plant. And at the same time, they're going to throw cigarettes and alcohol, the number two killer, down your throat. Why, why, don't, why don't people that have sense, common sense, people that, that can use logic, why can't they look at that and say, wait a second, that's not right? Right, right. I understand what you're saying there about that whole thing. Uh, the Internet uh, publicizes a lot of different rumors, and, uh, you know, I, over the years I've had no other choice but to report and read different rumors about you and different things, and, uh, you know, there have been some very unkind rumors about you and different things. What? Well, we can, we can discuss it right now. I'll tell you the truth about it all. Okay, well, there's one story that um, me and my producer were debating on whether or not to ask you, but uh, if you don't want to comment on it, we, we won't go there, but apparently you and Sabu were busted for smoking marijuana or something. Well, the, the truth, it was possession. I mean, the way that it goes down in legend, everyone's going to think that we were busted for smoking, but it's not true. I was speeding, we got pulled over, and the cops smelled some sticky green that I had in the glove compartment. And, and so it was, a, it, was a, it was an arrest for possession of marijuana in Ohio, and that led to way, way before my... Way before my hearing, you know, I was already crucified by the media because it's got all over every radio, TV, newspaper, Internet, everywhere. So it ended up, uh, you know, the consequences were that I got suspended for 30 days, dropped the uh, World WWE Championship and the ECW World Championship, um, and, I, and I stayed home for 30 days. cost me a lot of money being suspended for those days. But at the time, I was so fucking burnt out and sick of the routine uh, of being on the road that those 30 days were some of the best days of, uh, of my WWE time. In fact, at the end of the 30 days, when they wanted me to come back, I asked for more time off. Really? I really did, yeah. Paul was, uh, I was talking to Paul Heyman about it, absolutely. Just like, when I, just like when I was injured with my knee, I was out for a full 12 months. And even at yeah. the end of that, even at the end of that, you know, I was, I was asking for more time, more time, and a lot of that was to make sure that my knee was ready so I could do the Rolling Thunder and Five Star Frog Splash and not have to hold back when I got in the ring. Um, right. And a lot of it also was motivation. I didn't want to go back to work. So same thing after the 30-day suspension uh, that summer. Um, you know, I, I tried. I asked Paul. I said, "Look, tell him to keep me off, give me more time off, whatever." And when I went back, it sucked. I went back, and it was it was when they were trying to uh, relaunch this new ECW, and they totally had no idea how to fucking do it. So now, um, because because it, it seemed like a punishment, those of us who would never swallow the WWE Kool Aid, even while we were there, and the whole time we were still saying how much better ECW was, they said, "All right, all right, we'll bring back your ECW," and they brought it back to destroy it. No doubt about that. And, and in the meantime, while they're trying to destroy its old reputation and totally reinvent it under Vince McMahon, now we're out there wrestling in front of a thousand people a night because they didn't advertise their shows. We're doing yeah. no pay-per-views. So basically all of us boys were, uh, were thrown into a, a position where we were going to make a hell of a lot less money 
And as I said, that was a punishment for being loyal to ECW. Yeah. Do you remember when they did the uh, December to December pay-per-view and how terrible that was? And you were a part of yeah. that, I believe. That was terrible. And that put every ECW pay-per-view to shame, honestly. Yeah. To me uh, and to a lot of us, that was... We've said this several times, but that that was the death, the official death of the original ECW. And and I say we said that several times because every every once in a while we say, okay, no, no, that was the official death of ECW. And we've said that a few times, but with that pay-per-view you're talking about, that was where I knew that they wanted to um, put the original ECW down to, to bury RVD and to... Uh, have Bobby um, Lashley emerge as the new representative of the new ECW. That was the story right there. So uh, when I after um, after Tess beat me in that match and I was getting carried away, uh, a bunch of people in the front row turned their backs towards the cage and uh, they were chanting TNA and all kinds of stuff. And I'll tell you, I felt I felt the emotion and the passion from and the and the disapprovement from the from the crowd. You know, saying "fuck this, this sucks. We want the old ECW," but um, Vince would not hear it. He was stubborn. He would not hear it. He didn't think there was any people that remembered the old ECW, and he told me that himself. And, um, you know, this also led to my ultimate fucking departure because that was just, you know, totally burnt out and, and wasted on the whole scenario. Right. To me, the best match in the new version of ECW was yourself and Sabu against uh, Andrew Martin and uh, Mike Knox, that Extreme Rules tag team match. And I will tell you this. I don't like Andrew Martin, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for putting him through a table with that five-star frog splash. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we actually had we had some good ones. That's the thing. When it first came out, when it first came out, you know, I did the pay-per-view one night stand with uh, John Cena, and, and we knew come around the corner that this third brand was going to open up. That was a high high point for me in WWE. I was so excited. Yes. Now I get to be on their stage seen in front of the whole world, but seen the way that I want to be seen, you know, creatively, as an artist, the ECW, that's awesome, so at first it was like, ECW, that means anything goes, and then just a couple weeks into it, they started taking all that away, started making one Extreme Rules match per show, and well, we, we need to add credibility to this, no, you're, you're making it just like your other products, you're making it another now you got Monday Raw, Tuesday SmackDown, Wednesday. East. It's all the same shit now, except for you're you're watering the ECW down even more because you're sending other stars there, thinking that you're helping it, but it's just watering it down and confusing people. And I'll tell you, <laughs> the whole thing was a cluster fight. Uh, it was it was terrible, you know. It was even one point where they were going to take the ECW logo off the bottom of the screen and replace it with the WWE logo. I didn't like that. <laughs> they might as well. That's the thing. Is like the fans love and miss ECW so much that they still don't want to admit that this new ECW has nothing to do with the old ECW. And that's really what Vince wants. And that's what he told me himself, which was a very uh, it was a very frustrating conversation I had. With him. I had several explaining, you know, to him that the things he's doing aren't going to work, and him explaining to me that he knows more about what's going to work than me. And, hey, who am I to say what's best for a, a global fucking um, company, you know? To, but but I knew that, you know, that what the, the reason ECW was cool is because it was different. He totally took that away and made it the same as everything else. Right. What is your take on Vince McMahon? People say that he's like a diabolical son of a bitch that doesn't care about anyone, and a lot of the wrestlers say that. Is he very much like his on-TV personnel uh, in real life. Well, um, I'll tell you, I've never, I've never like gone, um, gone and, and played around a golf with him or anything like that. Um, I don't see him. I don't see the the Vince that um, I'm sure his family sees. And the Vince McMahon that I saw was always like around the arenas. You know, he's always treated me with nothing but respect. That's for sure. Uh, and he's also obviously a very smart businessman. He keeps himself insulated with uh, a lot of his cronies so that when you want to talk certain business to him, he wants you to go through the stages, you know, and, and he pays people to, to do that. Um, that way he doesn't have to admit that he knows stuff if, if, it, if it's his position 
you know, to to not know it. And um, it, it's you know, I mean, he's 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 worth a lot of money. He's on the top. But I think he does a lot of a lot of things good in that way. You know, um, I've always gotten along with him. Um, he's always treated me with nothing but respect. Uh, I don't agree with a lot of his views, and and he's also very stubborn. I think all of the McMahons. All of them are inside the the box of the uh, McMahon world, and I don't think any of them can see outside of it. When I left and walked out on top, you know, when I'm at the top of my career right there, and I and I walked out, that was something they could not understand. I was leaving my on my own decision, based on uh, what they were, you know, based on a lot. But while Stephanie, you know, was uh, trying to tell me how much they'd miss me, and, and she, she hoped it'd be a short vacation, I'd be right back, and Vince, you know, was saying it'd be, a, you know, hopefully it'll be a short trip, I'll clear my head and I'll come right back. Shano, not able to think outside of the fucking McMahon box, is uh, on the way out, he wants to pull me aside and tell me, you know, that the reason things didn't work out for me there. Right, so when Vince McMahon shows up at my door from hearing this and starts choking me, you're going to have my back, right? Say that one more time. When Vince McMahon, if Vince McMahon hears this interview and he shows up at my door uh, choking the life out of me, you're going to have my back, right? Sure. Let's see. Uh, it'll probably take me a couple more days to get there than him. But where are you at, Canada? Yeah. <laughs> right on. Great, great stuff. So you've got a lot of stuff uh, going on right now. And, of course, uh, you still talk to Paul Heyman? I do. Um, I speak to him. Um, but it's, it's, it's a lot more phone tag than actual conversation. But, yeah, we, uh, 